Michael, the atheistic philosopher is often in the position of refuting arguments for the existence of God, all kinds of arguments. But let's turn that around. Let's put it in the other direction. Do you have affirmative arguments for why atheism is a more legitimate worldview? Uh, yes, I think there are a number of arguments. There are four that I think are quite interesting. Uh, first of all, I would argue that atheism is the default position. That's based upon the idea that when you survey the alternatives, you have a large number of equally likely alternatives, and atheism, uh, theism is only one of those. Uh, a second argument uh, focuses upon the sorts of minds that we're acquainted with, right? And I think there's good evidence that in the case of human beings and other animals, the mind is the brain. There's no immaterial substance, right? And so there's an argument from that to the conclusion it's unlikely that God exists. A third argument, the one I think is most important, is the argument from evil, which focuses upon suffering and deaths of innocent people in the world and argues that the existence of God is unlikely. And then finally, there's another argument, which in a way is a version of the argument from evil, but it's a specialized version. And it's an argument from the hiddenness of God. And it's basically that the existence of God is much less evident than it, than it could be. And that's not a good thing, and that provides us with a reason for concluding that God does not exist. All right, let's, let's talk about each one of them. Uh, let's start with number one, that uh, atheism is the default position. In other words, the position that we should take as a first, as a first look. Um, but that, that seems contrary to our nature, certainly contrary to the cultural history of humanity, that every society has envisioned and imagined deities, spirits, whether it's from animism to monotheism, all societies, it seems, has some sort of an innate sense of a spiritual world. So why in that, cult with that cultural history do you have atheism as the default position? Well, I mean, on the historical matter, I mean, as you said, I mean, there was polytheism and so on. It was long journey from polytheistic beliefs and so on to monotheism, which arose only really in two places, Israel under Moses and uh, in Egypt and so on. So that uh, it took a long time for the idea of a monotheistic god to really arise. But why is it the default position? Well, because there are alternatives that seem to be on a par. I mean, consider, compare, for example, the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being, the god of monotheism, with an all-powerful, perfect, uh, all-knowing, but perfectly evil being, and with the alternative all-powerful, all-knowing, but morally indifferent deity. I would say that those three are equally likely, right? But if that's right, then pick any one of them, the probability has to be no greater than one-third, okay, right? Well, so, your assumption is that they're all equally likely. That's right, yes. I mean, that's a given assumption, and, and who knows? I mean, uh, the, 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 the innate sense that humanity has had is that, and maybe this is just a wishful hope, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, it's an innate sense that, that the the one that exists is the good one. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, that's, I think that just is a wishful hope and so on. That is that uh, the idea that there's, you know, all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly evil being is not a very appealing idea, right? And but so you're saying it's equally discarded. logical, equally statistically logical? Yeah, from a logical point of view, I mean, the, you know, the idea of being perfectly good and the idea of perfectly evil, those are, so to speak, concepts that are really on a par and so on in terms of the scope that they cover, right? And so if you go back to sort of principles of inductive logic, I would argue that they should be treated as equally likely and similarly for a morally indifferent deity. And, and and, and the, the, uh, the evidence that you have of creation, because if there is a deity, be it an all-good deity, an all-evil de deity, or a morally uh, ambiguous deity, uh -huh. kind of an ACDC god kind of thing. <laughs> uh, so of, of all those three, the, the evidence of the physical creation uh, is, um, comes down where? Well, I think it comes down in terms of morally indifferent deity. That is, <laughs> if it's an omnipotent, omniscient one, I mean, you look at the world, it's very mixed. A number of great things, a number of very good things, a number of very bad things, and very bad actions, and so on. And so that it seems to me both the idea of perfectly good deity and perfectly evil deity are really very problematic. And you should think that there's a deity who doesn't really care about good and evil. Or that deity has a very complex and rich understanding far beyond our understanding of what this complex amalgam of good and evil is and what an end result is. Well, you may be defining that as morally indifferent, and that God may, may define it in a different way, but that, that looks like the evidence. Well, I guess there's another argument. That's going to get into the argument from evil, basically. Oh. Okay. okay, so that's argument number one. Argument number two is that the only kind of minds that we know, consciousness, humans mainly, maybe animal, are embodied within brains. And the argument is that uh, if, if we're going to imagine some other mind, we've never, we don't have evidence that there's another, any kind of minds other than the ones that are produced by brains. Uh, you're not arguing that it's impossible to have a, a disembodied mind. I mean, we certainly all imagine 
that. That's certainly a logical possibility, and some people, you know, believe it through spiritism or parapsychology or, you know, a religious belief or all sorts of things. I mean, there's all, there's a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence that all may be worthless, but you can't just dismiss the fact that there can't be a disembodied mind. Oh, I certainly think disembodied minds are possible and so on. I'm not a uh, materialist myself, but I think it's very unlikely there are such things, and that's based upon various facts that we know. I mean, if a bullet goes through the head, it tends to have an effect upon one's thoughts <laughs> and one's consciousness and so on. Drugs can change you from a depressed sure, individual to a sure. non-depressed individual and sure. so on. So the, I think there's a lot of evidence that we, unfortunately, do not have an immaterial mind or soul, right? And so I think there's good reason for thinking that in the case of uh, humans and other animals, the mind just is the brain. So, so therefore, the argument, though, is, again, a probabilistic one that basically says, since we have only seen minds that are produced by embodied brains, that it, it is less likely that there exists some disembodied mind. That's right. It is only a probabilistic argument. And I think it's, uh, I think, unlike the argument from evil, I don't think it provides uh, exceptionally strong evidence, but I think that uh, it is a reasonable projection for the minds we know. Of. Okay, now we're on your big one. Number three, the argument from evil. Let me hear it. Okay, well, uh, I think there's some bad things in the world. I don't do think, okay, right? But I think the Holocaust was not, not a great idea, okay? I think the tsunamis that killed, you know, I think around 300,000 people in India, that was not a good idea, okay, right? And so there, there are things that I think that you and I would change or prevent if we had the knowledge and power to do so. You and I would have prevented the tsunami. You might have given Hitler a little stroke or, you know, changed him into a, you know, laid back hippie and so on. He wasn't interested in killing six million people. A successful painter. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so the question is, I mean, if, if it's okay in the case of human beings to draw conclusions from what they do and what they allow to happen, okay, and you say, let's suppose that there's an all-powerful, all-knowing being, then why can't we draw probable conclusions from what that being does uh, or does not do, right? And so the idea is, if you look at the sorts of things that are allowed, things that you and I would have prevented if we could have, right, uh, then uh, the idea is it's reasonable to conclude that uh, any being that allows that is not morally perfect. But doesn't that uh, create God in our image that puts uh, our moral conscience or sense into the mind of God and assumes that that's the way things have to be? Uh, wouldn't the God who created everything that we know and that gets more enormous with each passing year as we discover about the universe, wouldn't that God have a vaster, grander purpose in which the evils that we think are very horrible now are just part of some vast, grand scale that, that have to be part of the complexity of the world? Well, I mean, the, the grand scale can involve various things. You can imagine a deity who was, just to speak, uh, aesthetically oriented, right, and was trying to create a beautiful canvas and so on, and, you know, suffering and so on all fitted into that sort of picture, okay? Uh, if that's the case, I would say, yeah, that sort of God could be, is a possible deity, right? But he isn't a God that's going to answer to fundamental human hopes, okay? He provides no reason at all for thinking that evil will in the end be defeated and that good will triumph. He provides no reason at all for thinking that death is not going to be the end of our existence and so on, right? So it doesn't answer to the fundamental hopes that people have. So that sort of deity, I think, though interesting and a possibility, uh, is not going to uh, be appealing from the human point of view. I think to make sense out of that argument, you have to have the God who is the aesthetic God who is drawing this beautiful canvas also add something after death. Because only through an eschatology that, that uh, has people living beyond death can you rectify on an individual basis uh, the, the horrible nature of, the, of this life. You'd have to add that in. Okay, but I mean, the question is what justification you have for adding that sort of thing in, okay, right? I mean, there are various reasons why you might think that we survive death. If we had immaterial minds or souls, then that would be well, a reason. I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that. All I'm saying is that in order for the theist to, to drive that argument to his conclusion, you are forced to come to the conclusion that there must be something after death, because then the ar because without that, none of the rest of the arguments hold. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that if humans don't survive death, then there's no hope at all of answering the argument from evil, right? But I think even if they do, it's deeply problematic, okay? If you consider, for example, you know, children who are tortured and suffering enormously, right? The question is, why would reason could there be for allowing that to happen? And simply saying, you know, that after death things are going to be made better doesn't seem to me to be a satisfactory answer. I mean, like, the child could enjoy a good afterlife without undergoing the, the torture experience before death.
Totally agree. The question is, is can the world be so structured to enable uh, human beings to be the kind of free will, uh, uh, character building um, uh, entities that will progress to this afterlife. I mean, that's the argument. And that there has to be the capability in the world for all of these different uh, uh, forms of evil. But that on an individual basis, the people who have suffered the worst of the evil will at least be given not only justice, but recompense in the next life. Well, the idea that, I mean, the evils in the world serve the purpose of sort of character building or soul making is a very common idea, okay, right? But I mean, I think if you look at the world, uh, it doesn't seem to be a good world even by those sorts of standards, okay, right? You have people who are really quite unpleasant individuals who live lives of luxury and ease and so on, right? Uh, you have young children who are, suffer and die before they've any, any chance to develop their character. Certainly so, but this is the part, uh, this is part of the world as it exists. This is, allows its complexity, its richness, but that though that child who suffered and that person who supposedly benefited from the evil, there'll be some recompense, some justice in the world to come. I mean, that, that's the only way to give the argument consistency. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm saying to give consistency, you need that. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, but I mean, I'm saying that even if you have those sorts of goals, it's still not good enough for not you. Not good enough. The world can still be <laughs> different and achieve those goals more effectively. Okay, let's go to number four: the hiddenness of God. Okay, well, the basic idea here is that um, uh, the existence of God is uh, not exactly as evident as the existence of you know chairs and, and people and so on, right? And this is, of course, illustrated by the fact that many people have serious doubts about the existence of God, right? And so the starting point of the argument is to, first of all, say that the existence of God could be much more evident than what it is, and one needs to explain that in detail, and then to argue that it'd be a good thing if the existence of God were more evident than what it is, right? And so that's basically the structure of uh, the argument of the hiddenness of God. But wouldn't that create a, uh, a very rote, mechanistic society where God was so prevalent and so certain that everybody would have this the same happy smile on their face? Uh, maybe in some ultimate world, that's the way it'll be. Uh, but I, 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 for one, wouldn't be all that comfortable in such an absolute mechanistically controlled world where everybody had the same greeting with each other and God was there. I mean, I'm not sure it would give me an opportunity to, to explore myself, even if I go in wrong direction sometimes. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you're maybe thinking of a very heavy-handed God, right, who's going to be on top of you all the time, right? But, I mean, take the idea of being perfectly good uh, in the way we normally understand it when we apply, you know, a lesser idea to people, right? And think of the virtues that people have, like a sense of humor and so on, right? right. God is not often portrayed as having a sense of humor, right? Okay? Yeah, I think he does, but that's a separate issue. That's right. right. You know, and people think if you say, gee, God, you don't exist, he says, uh, gee, Michael, go to hell, right? <laughs> okay? A God could have a sense of humor, right? Not be offended by those sorts of things, right? You know, be heavy-handed, right? And so, you know, uh, God might say to you, you know, I don't think that's like, a good thing for you to be doing. I think you should reconsider the light of the following sorts of things and so on, right? If you said, well, my plan is actually to kill a large number of people, yeah. he would say, well, now, I'm afraid that's not something you're going to get away with, okay, right? Uh, but I think there'd be tremendous scope for individuality and people could develop or not develop in various ways, okay? So you could have a possible world uh, in which God was much more evident, everybody knows, but, but not heavy-handed. So that would be your kind of God if existed would, would operate that kind of world, as opposed to a world where the existence of God was very problematic, because oh, right. you're a smart guy, I respect you very much, and you don't believe in God. And so, uh, from my point of view, you know, that, is that your fault or God's fault? I mean, your, your point is that that's God's fault. He could have made himself less hidden to where you, I mean, you, you have nothing against God. You'd, mm -hmm. I think, probably like to have a God so you could live forever and all that sort of stuff. That's right, yeah. I mean, look, a lot of people, there, there's a, a book on the hiddenness argument, okay, and a lot of people in the book argue, in effect, that uh, uh, people intentionally blind themselves, okay, uh, intentionally turn themselves in the face of God and so on. I think what's going on here is the idea that if there's a God, we'll know that there's, there's a moral law and so on that's enforced, right? And so there's certain things we want to get away with, right? And the argument seems to be that, you know, that uh, you'll have more trouble than you know, committing adultery and so on, right? Now, if you, if you say, which would you prefer, you know, a world where you can commit adultery without someone, you know, punishing you, right? Or a world where you have a chance to live forever, right? That's an easy choice, right? Yeah. And so it seems to me that you ought to be very attracted to the idea that God exists. And so the idea that people intentionally blind themselves to the existence of God seems to be very implausible, right? Okay, Michael, four arguments why God does not exist. Which is the big one? Uh, the argument for evil, definitely. 
And I haven't asked you this. Are you an atheist or agnostic? I'm an atheist. I think the existence of God is very unlikely. Ah, very unlikely, but I, I don't hear zero. No, no, I'm happy it's not zero, but uh, it's very low indeed.